Welcome everyone to the beginning of what is a new video series here on OTRS Central, this retro wrestling review series. Every couple of Thursdays, I think on social media they call it Throwback Thursdays, we're going to take a look back at an old wrestling show from days gone by. It could be WWF, WWE, WCW, ECW, AWA, WCCW, other random stuff. It could be pay-per-views, it could be episodes of Raw, it could be episodes of SmackDown, it could be episodes of Nitro or Thunder. All of these are possibilities. I'm looking forward to it, and I'm sure some of you are too. And for those of you that might want to suggest going back and review old WrestleMania, SummerSlam, Survivor Series, Royal Rumbles, keep in mind I've already reviewed all of those in review series for those big four WWE pay-per-views. And I'll put the links to each of those playlists in the description box down below. So in your free time, check it out if you want to talk about some old wrestling. And that's what we're going to do today. Talk about some old wrestling. And before I even go there, make sure if you're enjoying this and this is helping you hashtag make wrestling fun again, make sure you click that subscribe button. It's hashtag subscribe or die. And click the bell, what the hell, so that way you can be notified every time one of these gets uploaded or anything else that I do on this channel. And if you want to make a suggestion for the next review that I should do as part of this Retro Wrestling Review Series, leave a comment in this video. Go to Twitter, go to Facebook. I'll leave all of those links for social media there as well. Make your suggestion for the next one in a couple of weeks. This should be fun. But today... It only feels right. It only feels natural. All the shows in the history of professional wrestling that I could have went back and reviewed, it feels like there's only one option, one real choice for me to go back and review. It feels good. So good. And I know a lot of you are looking forward to this because, again, knowing me, knowing my history, you know what you're about to get. We're here to talk today about WCW Sin 2001. Ow, baby! Now, we could sit there and say, do a traditional show review and go through everything and break down everything, and you're going to get a little bit of that, but let's face it, you really only want me to talk about the main event because you know that's where the money is, and believe me, we're going to get there. But I, I do want to take a step back here for a quick second and just talk about early 2001. As I watched this show, some things I remembered, some things I did not. It was interesting to see some of the guys that I would come to know more over the years and the way they were being utilized at this point in time, like Shane Helms, Chavo Guerrero, uh, Rey Mysterio Jr., you know, just, just to name a couple. It's funny to go back and watch this stuff. You see these guys as much younger versions of themselves, and you're like, oh, man. And like I said, it's funny when I remember some of this stuff. Some of this stuff, I'm like, oh, I don't remember. Maybe that's why I don't remember. But you can see where they were in a downturn from a creative standpoint, but... I hate this whole notion sometimes of how WCW in this time frame always gets so buried and everybody wants to blame a Russo, a Bischoff, the inmates running the asylum, the Nashes, and so on and so forth. But the fact is, even WCW in early 2001 in its dying days was still getting several million people to watch Nitro every single week. People weren't buying the pay-per-views, but that was even going back years uh, to the peak of WCW in the Monday Night Wars. I think the buy rate for this... Uh, Sin pay-per-view was like 0.17 in the Royal Rumble in January 2001 was like a 1.2 or 1.3. So there weren't a lot of people buying this. But I can remember back in the day, I did buy this. I used to buy all the pay-per-views. I watched as much wrestling as I possibly could. My, oh my, have the times have changed. And it's striking to you when you go back and watch this show. Uh, but let, let's dive into the show. Uh, the Cruiserweight Championship match, the way he kicked off the show with Sugar Shane Helms and Chavo Guerrero, this match was outstanding. This is the type of match I would want out of a Cruiserweight division even now. This is the type of match that I would want opening up my pay-per-views because it gets the people in their seats, it gets them invested, and it was amazing going back and watching this match again for the first time, frankly, in probably 16 years to see how much the crowd was involved just throughout the entirety of the match. Whereas now you hear it with audiences, you get a big spot, you get some buzz and noise. Then they go back into normal stuff and they've programmed the audience so much to where you only can react to the big spots that people don't really get invested in the story, the match, the performers, nothing. But they were here and these were the cruiserweights. 
And they didn't have to do a lot of big stuff, but if they did something even remotely big, it really got a reaction. But in general, just to go back and watch a decade and a half ago and see the change in the wrestling audience compared to now is absolutely striking. Absolutely striking. But an outstanding opening pay-per-view match on any card. On any card. You could say from a pure wrestling standpoint, this was the best match of the night. This Cruiserweight title match. And of course, that was the opening match, and that just tells you how everything going. Uh, Reno defeats Big Vito in a who-gives-a-fuck feud. I don't remember caring about this 16 years ago. I don't remember caring about Reno's finisher. What is that, fucking Crossroads? I don't remember caring about Big Vito. Young Dragons defeat Evan Courageous and Jamie Noble in a randomly thrown-in match. Like, they even announced... You pumped it up as such that this was unannounced, that we weren't building towards this in any way. It was just kind of randomly thrown on the card. They didn't even know they were going to wrestle. Then why would I care? I got to see, what, Jimmy Wang Yang, and that was good enough for me? I guess. Speaking of other stories I didn't care about, or in this case, characters I didn't care about, why was Mike Sanders getting pushed so massively in 2000 and 2001? Can anybody, for the love of God, please answer that for me? Why were they so giggly tits about Mike Sanders? Like him and Ernest Miller wrestling for who's going to be the WCW commissioner. And of course, WCW had multiple authority figures on TV because you had Ric Flair, I believe, was CEO at that time. And then Mike Sanders at this, getting into this match, was the commissioner. Ultimately, Ernest Miller won. It was fun to see Miller, to see the cat one more time. Uh, but that's all about, I need to remember about this, frankly. It was just there. And again, I don't know what was the incessant force of Mike Sanders at this time. Like, where did you think you were going to make big money off the dude? I'm just saying. Uh, the penalty box match. Team Canada and the Filthy Animals. Hacksaw Jim Duggan as a special guest referee. It, it feels Russo-ish, doesn't it? It, it? Whatever. If I can get serious for just a moment. um, I can't. This is, I look at, there's freaking Lance Storm on one side. There's young Rey Mysterio unmasked on the other side. And we're utilizing them in a penalty box match where we have Hacksaw as the freaking guest referee. <laughs> Team Canada beats the Filthy Animals and Hacksaw Jim Duggan has to raise hands in victory. And, you know, even though... He didn't want to sit there and credit him with the victory. Then he eventually did. Yeah, this was bad. This speaks to the bad that you would get out of WCW in this time frame. Just stipulations thrown in there, and it just felt like maybe it wasn't really necessary. Uh, the Hardcore Championship match. You got Crowbar, Meng, and Terry Funk. It was what you would expect out of a match with Terry Funk revolving around a hardcore title. It was kind of... Odd at times. Um, they're battling in women's bathrooms. They're doing all this other shit. You know, but you look at it too, and you look specifically at Meng and Terry Funk, they're perfectly suited for a hardcore division because you believe that both of these guys are badass motherfuckers because you know they are both badass motherfuckers. And I ended up enjoying this match more than I thought I was going to, and I popped a little bit remembering that Meng was going to win this match. That's something that came back to me as I was watching it. And when he won, I won't lie, I popped a little bit. Not great from a visual standpoint. It was kind of confusing how the way they started it off. You had the Terry Funk and Crowbar going at it for several minutes, and Meng eventually comes back and finds him. It was kind of weird, but it worked for me. Uh, it was one of the rare highlights on the show, of course, until the main event. Tag Team Championship match. Natural Born Thrillers defeat the Insiders. So here's a time where you've got guys like O'Hare and Palumbo, younger guys, maybe uh, the face of the next generation in terms of tag teams. And you've got the Insiders. You've got DDP and Kevin Nash, kind of an odd, weird tag team anyways. But you still had stars. You still had stars um, at this time. You still had some big names. You know, so... It wasn't always that bad, I guess. And as I went back and watched the show, it wasn't always that bad. I mean, you weren't getting a lot of, out of Nash even at this point in time. I almost tore my quad watching this. But the, the Natural Born Thrillers won. And, and it was one of these things. It's like, oh, that's why they were the take. You know, you start piecing together stuff from the past. Uh, but it was just striking watching. I'm like, damn, Sean O'Hare's dead. I think the other three guys are all alive. Going back and watching a wrestling show 16 years ago, there might be a chance that a few of these guys on the show are dead. 
So that's another thing that kind of stands out. U.S. Championship match between Shane Douglas and General Rection. What was it? A freaking chain... Oh, first blood match, excuse me. Where the whole concept was they had to go up and get a fucking chain that was hanging way the hell up there. Why did we have to go all the way up there to get a goddamn chain? Why was that a big part of it? I know it tied into the gimmick of Shane Douglas pulling a chain out himself and busting open humorous general <laughs> erection. I mean, my God, this is the Russo influence. Humorous general erection. And no matter how much you tried to call him general erection, we all know it was general erection. Just like GI bro and all the rest of the fucking guys. Vince Russo and his stupid ass <laughs> sexual innuendos names. Sports Entertainment Exchange. Oh my God, guy, you came up with sex. At least nobody would ever be stupid enough to allow you to name the wrestling. Oh, T and A. Because yeah, it's total nonstop action. <laughs> I look back at Shane Douglas and I'm like, you know, this was a guy that was good on the mic. But I always thought the franchise gimmick was appropriate to him in the sense that he was the only one that ever thought he would be a franchise player. Um, just the type of guy that you would get nothing more out of than the undercard or maybe midcard. I don't know if I would be putting a United States championship on him. But at that time, that's what they did. So fucking be it. I thought the match was stupid. I thought the whole gimmick of having to go up here and get this metal chain just in order to be able to use it. Where you could just, it's a first blood match. So who gives a shit? I thought that was dumb. Uh... <laughs> And then throughout the night, we had a couple of different things featuring Buff Bagwell and Lex Luger. Totally buffed. Oh, my God. <laughs> totally buffed. <laughs> Taking out Goldberg and Sarge. <laughs> so let me get this straight. We're putting Goldberg's career on the line where his help is Sarge going up against Lex Luger and Buff the Stuff Bagwell. How the fuck do you think this went? Ah. This was trash. <laughs> the poor fucking fans that were there that thought it was going to be the last time they ever saw Goldberg. They were so fucking pissed. That Indianapolis crowd was silent. <laughs> You could have yelled bomb and nobody was fucking moving. They were hot. This is at the time where, you know, it was one of these situations again where WCW felt like they were struggling. In some ways they were, especially financially. Um, they were trying to gain some traction. And, you know, it's appropriate, I guess, that I'm wearing the Goldberg shirt for talking about WCW Sin 2001. But why would you sit there and create a storyline? I can't remember if it's due to injury, if it's due to anything else. And frankly, it doesn't matter. Just looking back at it from a show standpoint, why in the bluest of blue fucks would you build a show around about the potential for taking one of your biggest names and retiring his ass? Where's the money to be made here? Where is the fucking payoff? And by God, for all intents and purposes, you're doing it with people that are even older than Goldberg and Buff Bagwell and Freaky Luger. This is that shit we're talking about. And when we go back and talk about the shit that was WCW at this time. All right, we've talked enough about the rest of the fucking show. Let's get to the one match that you want me to talk about. Let's talk about the one thing that actually freaking matters. A fatal four-way for the WCW World Heavyweight Championship. Oh, baby! And this just screams out what WCW 2001 was all about. Scott Steiner's your defending champion. It's got, of course, that Memphis mid-card piece of crap. Just fucking do it! Broke 10,000 goddamn guitars in his career. Never drew a fucking dime. Like, if you drew a dime on paper... You would have drawn more dimes in your lifetime than Jeff Jarrett ever drew in his fucking career. Fuck this shit. And then, of course, the man, the myth, the legend, he rules the world, Psycho Sid, and, of course, a mystery opponent that we're building up into being the biggest and greatest fucking thing of all. And then the match happened. <laughs> Jeff Jarrett is working with Scott Steiner. It's basically those two against Sid because who fucking knows? Who cares? We get to that special moment 
that special time where magic happens. It's like the first time you have sex. The first time you busted a nut. <laughs> you always remember. You always remember. <laughs> the fateful decision of Psycho Sid going up on the second turnbuckle. Not the top rope, not the top turnbuckle, but the second turnbuckle. In order to hit, hit fucking Sid with the big boot in the face. And Johnny, this is all Johnny Ace's bullshit. Johnny Ace was begging and pleading with them to do this spot. Why would you take a look at fucking big ass Sid Vicious, Psycho Sid, and think he needs to do a big boot off the turnbuckle? That's not his game. That's not his forte. That's not his repertoire. Why are you asking this fucking giant monster dude to do something stupid like this? And not to be like the finisher, not to be the big culmination, but just to be a randomly thrown in spot in the middle of the fucking match. So that way we can get to the mystery man being revealed. So of course, Sid, being the good soldier that he didn't want to do it, but he ultimately did it, he got up and magic happened, baby. He snapped, crackled, Bob. His leg was like six ways from Sunday. <laughs> and I don't care how much the WWE Network tries to mask it and hide it, by changing the way that it is presented, no, bitches, I watched it live 16 years ago. It was all live, baby. You're not going to be able to edit this shit out from my memory, no matter what you try to do. <laughs> so Psycho Sid, he breaks his fucking leg. It fucking shatters in the poor dude. It's sitting there on the mat, writhing and screaming in pain. In the meantime, nobody knows what the fuck is going on. They look down at his leg and they say, oh, shit. That's not good. Our whole match finish is now fucked up. So the poor guy is sitting there screaming on the ground. Ah, 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 ah. So Scott Steiner comes over and tries to fucking kick him a couple of times. And then as we get to the whole big thing of the, the, the mystery fourth guy... As Sid's writhing, writhing in pain, only Scott Steiner would sit there and back up into him and accidentally kick him in, his, in Sid's fucking boot. Because Johnny Ace wanted him to expand his offensive repertoire. He had a hard on for him doing this fucking spot. So the mystery guy comes out. And of course it's fucking Road Warrior Animal. Why is it Road Warrior Animal? Who fucking knows? Did we really follow up on this after WCW Sin? Fuck no, who cares? Why would we bring an animal and not bring in Hawk again? Who knows and who fucking cares? The whole story was going to be that this is all one big screw job on Sin. Well, I believe Johnny Ace did all the screw job you freaking needed putting together this fucking mess. Ah! His leg is going like a... He's hurt. I think he's seriously hurt. Yeah, you think he fucking broke his leg? His bone is bent in like three different places. His foot's in an entirely different angle than is humanly possible on a healthy leg. And we're wondering whether or not he's got a serious leg injury. <laughs> oh my God. Now this, ladies and gentlemen, this is a main event. This, ladies and gentlemen, is professional wrestling awesomeness. Some of you may be crossed out when you watch it. Some of you may think it's sick. Some of you might think I'm fucking sick. But to me, the truest of hard, hardcore wrestling fans should love every fucking thing about it because it's about the story. It's about the setup. It's about who it is. As Hulk Hogan once said, Psycho Sid, our <laughs> should have been in a woman's song. <laughs> And here he is in the main event. Ah! I wonder when he was laying down, screaming on the ground, writhing in pain. I wonder if he was asking if we could go again and James Ross had to yell in his ear, Now we're live, buddy. I'm wondering if he was sitting there and saying, You know, now I know that you are half the man that I am. Ah! And I have half the brain that you do. And week after week, you'd kind of try to come out here and make me look like a jackass. 
<laughs> Johnny Ace, mission accomplished. Hit the big 6'8", 330-pound muscle-bound fuck to come off the second turnbuckle and hit the big boot from hell. <laughs> so, so for some of you that are wondering how I'm going to grade this show, one, it had Psycho Sid break his leg in the main event. How the fuck do you think I'm going to grade it? This is must watch pay-per-view if there ever fucking has been one. This shit is five stars. I don't give a fuck what any of you say. If you talk about this show and you talk about match quality and you focus on match quality, you're a moron, period. This is all about the magic and history of Psycho Sid and what one less leg can do. But, with that said, with that said, it is an absolute crime that this man gave his leg, effectively really ending his career at the main event for a pay-per-view for a company that was dying. And he's still not in the WWE Hall of Fame. For all the people that want to mock Sid, for all the people that want to make fun of Sid, all the people that want to talk shit about Sid. This is a guy that main evented two WrestleManias. And the two guys that main evented a WrestleMania with him were freaking Hulk Hogan and The Undertaker. Let's not go back and have revisionist history and pretend like Sid doesn't fucking matter. Because in the grand scheme of professional wrestling, he absolutely does matter. And it's an absolute shame that more people don't know about him. One of the most enjoyable single markout moments I've had in the past decade as a wrestling fan was back in 2012 when they were doing that whole Heath Slater thing with the legends. And he's talking about, I rule the world because I knew what was coming and my God, was it fucking magic to see Psycho Sid and the fucking powerbomb again in a WWE ring. This is a guy that was also involved. If you remember going back, everything seems to find Sid. <laughs> he was a part of the shit that led to the Shockmaster's epic debut. <laughs> You've heard stories about Psycho Sid shitting his pants at WrestleMania 13. Psycho Sid jumping off the second turnbuckle, breaking his fucking leg. The point is, he's done more memorable shit and been a part of more memorable shit in the history of the fucking wrestling business than most of the people that you think of as big stars. You can take your CM Punk's, your Daniel Bryan's, your John Cena's, your Roman Reigns, and your... <laughs> fucking Randy Orton's and you can shove it straight up your uh, fucking ass. Fuck you. Psycho Sid is the man. Psycho Sid rules the world. For God's sakes, for me to just remind you that he was a part of the Shockmaster debut segment, main evented two WrestleManias, two WrestleManias, and on top of that, had this epic moment where you really remember that as effectively the end of his career. He's remembered for more things than lots of so-called big names in the history of the business. The man is absolutely a Hall of Famer, and I hope in 2018 the WWE does the right thing because it is time. It's time. That's for damn sure. Because never forget this. Never forget this. As much fun as I have at Sid's expense for the broken leg, Sid was a fucking man. This was a big, badass fucking dude. I don't give a shit what anybody says. When you look at Psycho Sid, you look at a big, freaky, intimidating son of a bitch. You look at somebody that looks like a goddamn professional wrestler. Not somebody that rolled off of their fucking couch like a fat ass after going through a bender of 12 Dunkin' Donuts and whatever the fuck else they were doing because they're fat and stupid. Psycho Sid looked like money. He was fucking money. This is the same Psycho Sid, remind you. I have to remind you of this, that at the Survivor Series 1996, got the Madison Square Garden crowd to turn against fucking Shawn Michaels. I want you to think about that for a second. Shawn Michaels, who the WWE for years has tried to tell you is the greatest superstar of all time and the greatest in-ring performer of all time. In that smart mark, hardcore fan heaven of Survivor Series 1996, Madison Square Garden, Psycho Sid 
got the crowd to turn against Shawn Michaels. Psycho Sid went in the babyface, left the babyface, won the championship, and the fans were legitimately excited. Psycho Sid! So don't you dare fucking tell me that Sid was trash. Don't you dare tell me that he isn't deserving of being a WWE Hall of Famer. This is equivalent to what happened at Survivor Series 1996. Would have been the equivalent of Roman Reigns getting the Madison Square Garden crowd at a WrestleMania Survivor Series SummerSlam, doesn't matter, to unanimously turn against Daniel Bryan or CM Punk. Could you envision that ever fucking happening? Well, back in 1996, that's a similar deal when you're talking about Shawn Michaels. And Psycho Sid turned the crowd. Like, from the beginning, like people realize, there's this fucker, and then there's fucking Psycho Sid. He turned a Madison Square Garden crowd against Shawn Michaels. He was a part of the Shockmaster debut segment. <laughs> Shit his pants, allegedly, in a WrestleMania main event. Main event of two WrestleManias and gave his goddamn left leg for the wrestling business and for your entertainment when he didn't even want to because of Johnny Ace said he wanted him to expand his offensive repertoire. Psycho Sid is a legend. Sid Vicious is the man. He rules the world. He is deserving of your respect and admiration. He deserves to be in the WWE Hall of Fame. And if you ever want to appreciate the greatness of Psycho Sid, then WCW Sin 2001 is absolutely positively a must watch. A must watch. This is a five star show for me. And throughout the rest of my life, I don't care. And if nobody agrees with me, they can go fuck themselves. Not every show is about great matches and this and that. Sometimes it's about the moments. It's about the people. And Psycho Sid. We should really call WCW Sin, WCW Sid. Because if anything, he should be immortalized for this show. The man gave his left leg. For this show, we can at least rename it after him, damn it.